So good morning to you, to the uh, welcome to the last session, the third module of this uh, topic on slope deflection method. In the last two sessions, we started with an introduction to the slope deflection method. We began with simple problems involving only joint rotations, both known and unknown. In the second module, showed how simplifications in terms of the degree of kinematic indeterminacy can be obtained whenever you have problems where the end support is either hinged or roller. We also looked at with chord rotations and the examples we took related to problems where the chord rotations were known, for example, due to support settlement. What happens when the chord rotations are not known? So that is what we will explore in today's session, module 3, where we have unknown joint translations. Uh, these degrees of freedom are referred to as sway degrees of freedom. And of course, in addition to the translation unknowns, you also have unknown rotations. Uh, we are going to show you something new, probably for many of you, and something interesting. And uh, we will even stretch a little into the stiffness method of analysis. So if you see that all these sessions have been graded deliberately uh, from module 1 to 2 to 3. Um, it is like we first learn to uh, crawl, then we learn to walk, then we learn to run, and for those of you who are very interested, you can fly. So, module 3, we deal with unknown joint rotations. We begin with the first, uh, first a brief review of what we covered in module 2. Then we will see how important it is to identify the sway degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom are independent displacement coordinates. So, uh, you should not wrongly identify the degree. If they are related, you should take only one of them. We look at some example problems involving simple beams and frames with unknown sway. And we will show how when you have cases of symmetric frames, symmetrical portal frames under lateral loading, these problems are known as pure sway problems, a great simplification is possible. And we will finally look at more difficult problems where you have frames with inclined members, inclined columns. So first, a brief review of module 2. It was only in module 2 that we covered the complete description of the slope deflection equations. We said that the n moments clockwise positive in any intermediate beam in a continuous system can be expressed as follows. And these are standard equations everybody uh, probably knows by heart. MAB is equal to MFAB plus 4 EI by L theta A plus 2 EI by L theta B minus 6 EI by L phi AB or if you want minus 6 EI delta divided by L squared. Both are equivalent. We introduce you to the concept of chord rotation. Phi is uh, nothing but the differential settlement divided by the span assumed to be clockwise positive. So when the chord rotation is positive, you get a negative sign and we gave a proof for this. And also similarly, you have the equation for MBA, MBA is equal to MFBA plus 2 EI by L into theta A plus 4 EI by L into theta B minus 6 EI by L into phi AB. You can also write this conveniently in matrix form. When you have the far end on a hinge support, as in this case, the bending moment at the joint B is either 0 or it is something known. In such cases, we do not need to write a separate equation for MBA. We need only one equation and we can ignore the theta B as an unknown. And that equation 
is MAB is equal to MF not AB which is the fixed end moment in a propped cantilever plus 3 EI by L into theta A minus 3 EI by L into phi AB. And we did many examples demonstrating uh, the use of these slope deflection equations. We also gave you one assignment at the end of uh, the last session. We asked you to solve this problem simple two span continuous beam with applied loading and with uh, settlement. So let us quickly go through this problem. We asked you to draw the bending moment diagram and the probable deflected shape. Well, you can take advantage of the fact that A and C are roller supports. Ideally, B should have been a hinge support because otherwise the whole thing will start rolling. Even this problem can resist loads for the loading condition given. And uh, theta A and theta C can be ignored. So, so, we have reduced the degree of kinematic determinacy to one single unknown theta B. Our first task is to find the fixed end moments. Mind you, you have to find the fixed end moment only for AB and you have to treat it as a propped cantilever with fixity only at B and a hinge support at A. And you know that because it is symmetric, the fixed end moment will be one and a half times the conventional fixed end moment which is Q naught L squared by 12. Very easy to work out. That is it. No more fixed end moments. All others are 0. Now we write down the slope deflection equations for beam AB. You should write actual rigidity. In this case, it's 3 EI. Its span is 6 meters. Its core rotation also you must correctly write. It's delta B minus delta A by L. It turns out to be clockwise positive. 0 0.003 meters divided by 6 meters. And so you can write the equation for MBA. Similarly, for beam BC, you should note that the EI is just EI. And the chord rotation now is negative. The left support goes down by 9 mm. So the chord rotation is 0 0.009 by 3. 3 meters is a span with a negative sign. If you do this correctly, you won't go wrong. You've got your two basic slope deflection equations. That's all. The only unknown is MAB, MBA, and MBC, and you know that they have to be equal and opposite. The fact that they have to be equal and opposite is your governing equilibrium equation. So you can write the equation for MBC and expand them, simplify them, and write down equilibrium equation. You need only one. So theta B will give you that equation. There is no net moment at B. So you take the uh, slope deflection equation, add them up, and you can solve them. Get a solution for EI. Theta, EI theta B turns out to be minus, which means you have an anticlockwise rotation. You plug in those values, and you can get in the answers for MBA and MBC. As you can see, they are equal and opposite. Now you can draw the free body diagrams correctly. Minus 141 kilonewton meter plus 141 kilonewton meter. Find out your shear forces. We've shown you how to do all this in the last class. Draw, find out the reactions if you wish, and draw the shear force diagram. Draw the bending moment diagram. Okay, you need to find out where the bending moment is maximum. That's where the shear force changes its sign. It's actually easy to find out where it's maximum. 68.5 is your uh, reaction at left end. It's the shear force will will drop at the rate of 15 kilonewton per meter. So wherever it drops to zero is easily obtained by 68.5 divided by 15. That's how you get 4.56. Once you know this value, you can find the bending moment at that location. It turns out to be 156.4 kilonewton meter, more than the bending moment you get under the support. Uh, it's an unusual bending moment diagram, and that is usually you should get a hogging moment under B, but the reason you're getting these sagging moments everywhere is only because you have a support settlement. So you should know all this, and from a design point of view, you should know these values. And that's your deflected shape. Everything is sagging. There's no hogging anywhere. 
right so now we move on to the next topic the next topic is uh, to identify sway degrees of freedom in beams and frames we showed you this slide earlier uh, as far as a beam is concerned if you have a non prismatic beam as shown here then this joint this node is a location where you can have not only a rotation you can have a translation it can go up and down and typically you don't know the deflection for any arbitrary loading you do neither know the deflection nor do you know the rotation and so the degree of kinematic indeterminacy here which you can split in unknown translation in k delta and unknown rotation in k theta it's 1 plus 1 it's 2 here for a plane frame element if you take this example of simple portal frame you will find that at every joint you can have two translations in two orthogonal directions so if you take the cartesian coordinates delta x and delta y similarly at this joint also you have two trans so you have four translations so nk delta is four and theta at this joint and theta at this joint so two uh, rotation so you have six but we know in design practice that some of these translations are uh, negligible for example we assume these all members to be actually rigid which means this column can neither increase in length or decrease in length by any significant amount in terms of energy we are actually saying the actual strain energy is a negligible amount of the total strain energy so there are many ways of saying the same thing uh, but you needn't worry too much the way to find out nk delta taking advantage of actual uh, stiffness in all the members actual rigidity in all the members is by subtracting the nk delta that you get by the number of constraining uh, this equation that you have so every member gives you one equation the length of the member doesn't change so you subtract by by 3 in this case so that's a kind of rule that you can apply so uh, 4 minus 3 uh, or totally 6 minus 3 you've got nk equal to 3 so you have two unknown rotations and you now have an unknown translation you can put it anywhere in this beam ideally you can put it to the right end this is what we normally do but you can put it on the left end also both the entire beam is going to move horizontally by some unknown translation and we also looked at this example of the pitch portal frame where you have three joints where you have three unknown translations uh, three unknown displacements two translations and one rotation so that adds up to 9 but you have 4 members so you can subtract 4 from 9 you get 5 and which two translations to take is left to you you can take any two um, you have to do it uh, sensibly and finally you have to convert all the translations into equivalent chord rotations that's why you have to do a little thinking that's what we'll do 